What's up YouTubers? Today I'm on Heaton Road in Bradford. Now today is a, a special vlog because um, our channel is not always about bricks and mortar. It's about people, the people of Bradford. And today is actually a true crime vlog we're doing. It's not often we do this, but this particular crime happened just over 40 years ago and it shook the Bradford community. So I'm gonna meet Mark shortly and we will follow the murder trail and hopefully something good will come out of this. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Today we've got a bit of a dark story to tell. Yes, um, a very, very dark chapter in Bradford history, I'm afraid. Um, we're currently standing on Heaton Road in the Manningham area outside number 236. This house was the residence of James Adams, a 46 year old man who was known more informally as Jimmy and he worked as a newspaper vendor and he also worked as a part time glass collector at the new Beehive pub in Westgate down in, near town and Jimmy was murdered in Bradford in 1981 and it's a crime that remains unsolved to this day but he lived here and not much is known about him we do know that he was adopted his adoptive parents were Audrey and Robert Normington and he was a very dear and respected friend to all who knew him there's no evidence that he was ever married and that said he was very very popular member of the community and amongst the friends that he had certainly down at the new beehive pub jimmy was described as being the sort of man that nobody could ever take offense at you know he was the sort of guy that did many good turns for people and he was well liked so what we're going to do now is we're going to leave jimmy's former home and we're going to go to the start of what was a grizzly murder trail basically the new beehive pub on westgate where Jimmy had worked that evening. And uh, what we'll do in our usual uh, Bradford Through the Lens uh, style, we'll try to find his grave as well, his resting place. Yeah, that would be nice. So here we are at the new Beehive pub on Westgate. Um, and to set the scene, it was a bank holiday Monday, Monday the 25th of May, 1981. And Jimmy actually worked here as a glass collector. And he was very, very well thought of by the regulars and also the landlord. Um, and on the night in question, the Bank Holiday Monday, he actually came here in a new suit. So he was obviously in high spirits. And by all accounts, you know, it was a night he was looking forward to. Um, and like I say, he was well thought of, highly regarded. And in the TNA following the murder, there were a few testimonials from some of the customers and also the landlord. Um, the landlord said that Jimmy was a decent, respectable bloke who did not deserve to die in the way that he did. Um, another customer, John McCallan, he said, we're all heartbroken about Jimmy. He wouldn't have hurt a fly. A young woman who only gave her name as Heather said he didn't drink and he only ever had 50p in his pocket. Violence of any kind would shock him. Everybody liked him and he always had a joke and a smile. So this was the place where he was on that final night. So around 12.15 on the morning of Tuesday the 26th of May 1981, the pub closed um, and it was usual practice for Jimmy to get a lift home or for somebody to walk with him home. But on that night, the customers decided that they were going to go out for a meal, but Jimmy didn't want to go for a meal, so he walked home alone. And that's where we're going to go now. We're going to follow the trail that he would have taken from here. So we're now leaving the new beehive on Westgate, and we're going to follow the path that Jimmy would have taken on that night. So we're heading towards White Abbey Road, lead on to Wetley Hill. And then at the top
top was Carlisle Road. So we're now at the junction of Wetley Hill, where you just looked there. Um, this is Carlisle Road. Wetley Lane is behind us. And this is where Jimmy would have walked to. Now we've got a couple of witnesses that came forward. One of them said at this junction, Jimmy was seen entering into a heated discussion with a blonde haired man with glasses. More of that later. But there is also speculation that Jimmy actually paid a visit to what was then the Sugarcane Club, which is now a solicitor's office behind us. This was one of the um, famous Bradford West Indian clubs, very, very popular at the time. The police did actually come here to the Sugarcane Club to speak to people who have been there on that Tuesday morning to see if they saw anything, but that came to nothing. Once upon a time there was actually a reservoir behind this wall here on Carlisle Road, but at the corner here with Bavaria Place, there are some facade elements here of what used to be public toilets. Um, this was an entrance point and you can actually see no longer in use, long out of use, it's since been blocked up. But this was the scene of the murder. So from a timeline perspective, we're now talking 1am on the morning of Tuesday the 26th of May 1981. Jimmy Adams was here, he entered the public toilets and witnesses actually saw this and they also saw what they described as a blonde haired man with glasses following him and he entered the toilets as well. And the witnesses were three Asian young men who were believed to have come from the Birmingham area and they heard a scream. And then the man with the blonde hair and the glasses emerged from the toilets and started going off in that direction. And the three Asian men gave chase and they actually grabbed him down by the Marlborough Auto Centre, but he broke free and he managed to get away. Up the police were called and Jimmy was found inside the toilets bleeding quite badly. He'd been stabbed in the front and he'd also been stabbed in the back and sadly he died behind this very wall. During the initial police investigation some evidence was actually recovered. A knife with blood and also a pair of glasses was found discarded in a work ditch here on Bavaria Place. During their investigation of the crime scene, the police discovered that Jimmy Adams had actually been stabbed 22 times inside the toilet. And they also discovered a blood trail which stretched for more than half a mile from the crime scene on Bavaria Place. And it went all the way up towards the Oak Lane area where the trail petered off. Leading the investigation, was Dick Holland, who was also involved with the Ripper case. And he put the call out for members of the public to come forward. And they had quite a small response, actually. It looks like only 12 members of the public came forward with information. There was a dawn raid in the area as well, where the blood trail ended, and that came to nothing. But the police were issued with an artist's impression of what the killer looked like and he actually does resemble the singer John Denver who had hit singles with Take Me Home Country Roads and Annie's Song. And again, the artist's impression didn't generate any results. And for many, many years, the murder remained unsolved. In 2003, the case was picked up again when new DNA evidence came to light, but again, nothing came of that. So the man who resembled John Denver was either unknown to the police before the murder or after. He was said to have been 20 to 30 years old and it's quite possible that he's still alive. He would be maybe in his 60s or his 70s, still waiting to be brought to justice. So we've just arrived at the Nabu Cemetery and we've got some detail where Jimmy is actually buried. Just across there I can see Mark going through the plots.
Any luck, uh, Mark? It's somewhere around here. Right. Could you just repeat the, the plot number for our viewers? Yeah, it's 273. 273. Well, there's a crematorium there. And the plot of land is actually nearby. No wonder we couldn't find him. He's here. This tree was obscuring. Managed to push it back as far as I can. Can you see where it says? Got a torch there? I have, Some yeah. Look. Treasures, memories of Jimmy Adams, who died May 26th of 1981, mm. age 46 years. Yeah. And I don't know who that is. Um, those are his adoptive parents, Bob and Audrey. Right. So at least they're all together. Yeah, let's just step back a bit and... Get an idea, I can't believe where he is. That took some digging out, did that? Yeah. So if I'm covered in bits of fur or yeah. pine or whatever. But thank God we found him. Um, just a bit of a backstory, really. He died, as the grave says, and as we've said earlier in the video, on the 26th of May. The funeral didn't actually happen until quite a few months after. On So I've got the, uh, the death notice here. On Thursday... August the 20th, 1981, so almost three months passed before he was given a final resting place. Right. And as we've already said earlier in the video, you know, this remains to be, as far as the police go, an unsolved crime. Very, very, very sad story, you know. He sounded like he was a great guy. Um, he didn't deserve what happened to him. Just one of those wrong place, wrong time things, really. Um, there's nothing much we can do for Jimmy in terms of bringing him justice. But what we can do, as we should be doing with everybody that we feature in these videos, is at least remember him. Yeah. You know, and what not, I'll do is, forgotten. yeah, and what I'll do is I'll drop a, a phone number to the Crime Stoppers, and uh, if anybody knows anything out there or. Recall yeah. anything after all this time? You don't know, do you? No. Just don't know. But sad. But, as always, rest in peace, Jimmy. Maybe one day. And can you uh, read the, the plot number out again, please, for our viewers? I can, yes. If um, they come down to Nabwood, it's in the R section and it's plot 273. 273. And you've got the easiest marker in the world there. Yeah. To use as reference. And there's a crematorium just behind Mark. The stone's also quite loose. Yeah. It would be um, a nice thing if we could get that more secure. So, as we've mentioned, you know, this is a tragic story, really, and one of the more disturbing elements of it was the lack of public response to it. Only 12 people came forward, which did lead the police and the Telegraph and Argus to speculate whether or not the public had been numbed by murder. I mean, there's a TNA piece there from around the time about the lack of response. Um, you know, this murder occurred just months after Peter Sutcliffe had been arrested and the reign of the Ripper was over and it should have been a bright new dawn for Bradford almost but the nightmare seemed to be continuing I mean there was a child over in the Wyke area of Bradford who was abducted raped and murdered uh, Anne-Marie Hamilton she was discovered in road foundations at Low Moor fortunately her killer was brought to justice but you know, it's so, so sad that we haven't got justice for Jimmy yet. Um, and as you've mentioned, if, you know, I don't know what good this video will do, but if um, it prods anybody's memories or if it makes somebody come forward to speak out, that can only be a good thing because 
it's a story that you know was it happened when I was a child and um, those toilets have always been like a haunting corner yeah. of Bradford yeah. very very sinister it's funny you say that I used to go across the road to Manningham library yeah and I used to walk on the other side I was actually a bit terrified mm. of what's happened so I was walking on the other side always avoided the toilets obviously yeah. So that was the cold case of James Adams, sometimes known as Jimmy Adams. And if anybody out there does recall this uh, event in any way or has any information, I think it'll be a, a good idea to actually make contact with the charity Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Stay safe. See you in the next vlog. Peace out.